Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to this second part of the presentation entitled These Models Look Familiar. Um, so in the first part, I've been through um, the statistical theory and the frameworks and the models um, that we use, starting from the simplest of all um, and complexifying them. Um, in, in, this, um, in these sections now, the idea is to start from the statistical, from the genetic models and the genetic analysis we perform and the position um, those analysis and those model within the statistical landscape that I've described before. Um, so a quick recap from the first part. We've talked about linear models and starting with the simplest of all. We've talked about extending it to the generalized linear model to fit several distributions um, of our Y variable, variable of interest, which can be continuous, um, discrete or, or account variable or follow a few more distributions. We've also talked about random effects, uh, which can accommodate also several types of outcome variables. Um, but most importantly, allow to fit highly dimensional data, um, um, a set of, of, um, of variables on which we add um, um, an hypothesis about the distribution of effect sizes, or also um, if, um, well, random effects, which we do not necessarily directly observe, but of which we know the variance covariance structure, which is enough to, to fit and estimate the model. GLM and the random effects models are all united in this uh, linear mixed model framework where we can fit um, fixed and random effects at the same time. And then I have not really talked about it so far, but statistical equation modeling, which you've heard a lot since the beginning of this course, can actually be seen as a generalization of the linear mixed model framework. I'll come back to this at the end. Let's start with SNP heritability. So we want to estimate heritability from um, an observed matrix of SNPs of the individuals. So let's assume you get given your trait of interest Y, we can be BMI, like as in the first part and the examples. We have covariates Z, such as age, sex, and sight. And we want to estimate um, NX, our full matrix of SNPs. We want to estimate the association between X and all the SNPs, which is the SNP heritability. Um, I, I think this formula, so this is clearly a linear mixed model um, as we have fixed and random effects um, in the same model. Um, I like this formulation as it emphasizes X, the fact that it's a large matrix of SNPs that we fit in the model. And the SNP heritability here is uh, SG squared divided, so the variance of the random effects divided by the variance of the phenotype Y. Um, so in practice, we estimate this model with covariates. Uh, and for example, using the GCTA software. Another um, model um, is the ACE model. So now we do not have any SNP measured, um, but instead we have a, 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 a related sample, um, which consists of twins, siblings, or, or just extended family designs. Um, so the model can be written um, in a very simple form too. So y equals z a, um, again with z being our covariates, age, sex, and so on. Um, and then we fit several random effects, g, c, and, and e. Um, g being the, the genetic random effect, c the shared environment. Um, and they all have um, their specific uh, variance covariance structure of the sample plus a scaling factor, um, which is the variance of that random effect. Um, but here, what's important to, um, to note, and, and this is why this formulation of the mixed model is interesting, is that the SNPs are not observed, and nor are the, the, the measurements of shared environment. It's not as if we measure um, really the environment within the families. It's all assumed to be known. And so that's what we do, actually. So the GRM here and the CRM, or the shared relatedness matrix, um, are actually assumed variance covariance or approximations um, that we know from the family relatedness and from um, all that we make from, from the data. So the GRM is now your pedigree matrix. So if you have twins, you're going to have one uh, on the off diagonal. And when this is a, a, a MZ twin pair, you can have um, 0.5 for a diagonal twin pair, and you've got zero for people who are not um, part of the same family. Um, for, SNE, for C, we assume that people who are reared together um, have the same shared environment. So it's one for people who are reared together and zero otherwise. But one could 
could just make different assumptions and fit a slightly different C matrix, which, for example, could contain the number of years that the twins have lived together or, um, or other more fine grained or more, more measurements. Um, but that's quite interesting. So now we can fit random effects and we can estimate the heritability, but we actually do not observe the shared environments or the SNPs, which is quite, quite interesting. All right, but we can also extend those models um, to apply. So this is a much more recent um, paper and method, as it, as it was published um, a few weeks ago, um, but to estimate the heritability from the whole genome sequencing. So instead of the SNP heritability that we had a few slides ago, where we had the common SNPs, to make it simple, now we actually measure the common and the rare SNPs. Um, so here in this paper, uh, the authors of Pierre Gwenstein um, had um, a sample of 25,000 um, individuals of European ancestry, but 33, close to 34 million variants. So compared to well, the 10 to 16 million variants we can get in um, the common ones. And, and their model is actually so the, the, the letters change a bit from, from the notation I've used before, but um, so you have XB, um, which is the, the fixed effects, so here the covariates, but then you actually have a mixture, so a sum of random effects, um, JI. And then each, so it's as if we were fitting SNPs, but chunks by chunks, and then those chunks are determined based on, on the uh, minor allele frequency, so the rarity of the SNPs, um, and and also um, whether they're in high LD or, or low LD with um, with other steps. So the idea behind this model is that we don't have a single G random effect now, but we have several GIs, and so our distribution of effect sizes becomes a mixture of distribution. So it's a lot more general, um, and 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 actually confers a greater fit of the model. These are the results sorry, that they obtained. So for height and BMI, the two traits of interest, so you have on the right-hand side the total, the sum of the balance components, and then um, on, on the, on the left-hand side, all the different balance components, which are binned by minor allele frequency, so from the um, more, most common to the rarest, and then the level of LD uh, linkage equilibrium, so how, um, how Correlated with other SNPs are the SNPs we are uh, studying. And so basically, instead of limiting ourselves to the common SNPs in high LD, which is very or common SNPs in general, which is what we do in, um, in the traditional SNP heritability, here you can see that there's the variance coming from rare SNPs, and especially ones that are in, uh, in, in low LD, for example. And so this means that we can actually recover part of the missing heritability by fitting all those rare SNPs this way, which is very interesting and actually provides one of the first answers to, um, to this question of what contributed to the missing heritability. So very interesting paper. All right, where well, we can even fit more, well, more complex or complex model, other complex models, um, under the form of additive dominant and additive by additive um, random effects. So let me explain a bit what this is, but this is another recent paper by Valentin Hiver and uh, still under the supervision of Peter Vischer. So here we recognize our fixed effects C, B, and now this time we have three random effects, A, D, and A, A. A is the one that we've seen before, so that's basically what we have in, twin, um, in the SNP heritability. Um, D is the dominance, so it's, um, as you, if you want, the quadratic effect of each um, variant with itself. And the AA is um, the first order interaction between all the variants. Um, well, those we actually, we can calculate the um, variance covariance matrices uh, from the SNPs. And then we can fit the model and estimate it, um, which they did in the UK Biobank. So these are across 70 traits in the UK Biobank. Um, so this is the additive uh, estimates, the dominance in the middle, and then the additive by additive on the right hand side. And what the authors uh, noticed is that, um, well, we can recover um, the SNP heritability, um, that the dominance uh, tends to be of a fairly um, marginal effect, 
Um, so very close to zero for most of the trades and rarely greater than 0 0.02 um, across the 70 trades considered. Um, as per the additive by additive, the effect sizes are a bit more spread out, um, but the statistical power is extremely low to detect anything in this sample size. All right, so we talked about variance components. Now let's talk about GWAS. So in GWAS, we have a measured genome, we have a trait of interest in covariates, and we want to find the genetic markers or gen genetic regions that are associated with the trait and that contributes to the heritability. So the model um, is now a linear model, so logistic or, 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 or linear, depending on the your ad comparable Y. And then you have covariates such as age, sex, site, and genetic pieces, um, on top of which you fit each SNP independently in the model and estimate it, its association A with the trait of interest. So this can be done in Plink. Uh, it's very efficient, very quick. Um, and as you can see here in the screenshot, um, you can fit a whole lot of different um, of, um, fixed effects, from case controls to quantitative traits to uh, first uh, order interactions and, and, and so on and so forth. All right, more recent method called Tractor, which you may have seen um, in press recently. So this comes from um, Ben Neal's group in the US um, and this paper by Elizabeth Atkinson. Um, so this is a very, so this is to answer um, a new challenge in genetics or recent challenge actually, uh, which is to perform analysis on admix samples. So it's not really new, but uh, we've, we've, we've had the tendency so far to focus on the most collected group, which is Europeans, and to more or less discard, or if not collect at all, um, people from admixed or diverse ancestry. So now these data sets are becoming available. There's actually a great push um, in terms of the science, but also in terms of the ethics and the field to um, increase the representativity and, 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 and to collect this, this data set. And now what we want to do is um, run GWAS uh, by keeping everyone in. So we maximize the power. And so we can actually also uh, model the, the, the possible relatedness or end the ancestry. So this is a really hot field of methodological development. And, and this tractor method um, that came out recently um, is probably the, the I would, I would argue the, the first convincing method that, that really can tackle some of these issues. Um, so it's a simple li uh, linear model, except that the covariates, it's the covariates that are where, where really the, the, the complexity comes from. And the idea is basically that for each individual, there's a mapping of the genome and, and um, the genome is painted uh, based on basically the, the major ancestry um, that it originates from, um, and and then the covariates um, depend on on where you are in the genome, and and on the local ancestry inference, um, which is estimated, and the covariates um, that are generated from this LAI um, um, process and and protocol. Um, and I like the summary that the authors give in the sample, which is um, that it produces. Um, and local ancestry aware regression model, which produces ancestry specific effect sizes um, and p values. All right, so you can also do GWAS um, in, in other softwares. Um, so, Sage, for example, GCTA, Bolt LMM, Fast LMM. Those um, softwares have in common that they perform a lin linear mixed model GWAS. How does that work? Uh, so we still have a covariate Z, age, sex, and site, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this time we also we estimate the um, A, which is the association with each SNP, while controlling for all other SNPs fitted in the model. Um, so I've, I've put the screenshot of some of these um, the software. One thing to keep in mind is that this formulation like this. Um, so the SNP i is fitted twice in the model. Once as a fixed effect, which is the, the effect we're interested in, and one as a random effect um, whose objective is to control for the very um, fine-grained cryptic population structure. 
Um, but the fact that we fit the SNP twice means that it, it, it leads to a reduction of power. So a more efficient way of doing this is, is by doing this leave one chromosome out uh, control. So for each SNP I, um, we, we perform a genetic control by fitting all the SNPs but the ones of the chromosome. Uh, and that's been shown to actually maximize statistical power and minimize false positive. So just to uh, finish on, on these advantages and pitfalls of linear mixed models, especially in GWAS. Um, so this is a great paper by Jian Yang about, about, about it. But in short, um, LMMs give you a power increase and a lower false positive rate if well done and if there's not double fitting. Um, they offer better control of the population structure. So it's just better than, than controlling for PCs, um, of which we never know which one to put, how many to put in anyway. Um, it offers greater power by conditioning on other hits. Um, the downfall or the downfalls or the limitations are that it requires a higher computational um, power than the linear models. Uh, we have to be careful that there's enough SNPs included in GRM. Um, so the LMM uh, results are robust. The issue of double fitting, which I mentioned before, which can reduce power. And also there's a practical limitation, which is that well, no, the logistic version is not always implemented. And that means that we have to run a linear model, even if our trait of interest is a disease status or a dichotomous or um, a binary trait. Um, although there are some methods now where we can retransform the estimates to sort of approximate where we would have got in the logistic model. This is this paper by Luke Lloyd Jones. All right, thank you very much for your attention and then um, tune in again for part three where we'll talk about more models.